Welcome back to Squawk on the Street. Let's get over now to Bertha Coombs, who joins us with a special guest. He is Cigna's CEO, David Cordani. Bertha. Thanks very much, David. Cigna was the first insurer to move to say it was going to cover all of the costs on COVID testing. Now it has joined with Humana to say it's also going to be covering first dollar costs for all of the treatments for coronavirus patients, not just hospitalizations, but also future medications, future vaccines. And they'll do that both in network and out of network. David Cordani joins me now to talk about that decision. David, how did you come to this decision and what were some of the considerations that that you took in? Good morning, Bertha. Um, as you know, we're, we're a global health service company and in a time of crisis, which is what we confront right now, we're challenging ourselves to step forward and help our customers, help our patients and provide them peace of mind. I appreciate your reference to the testing. We also leaned in with expanded telemed uh, resources, 90-day uh, delivery of medication. Um, in our announcement this morning, we also acknowledge that we're redeploying hundreds of doctors and nurses to support um, outside um, third-party telemed resources. So we're challenging ourselves to step in and help our customers. And in this case, as we step back and see as individuals are fighting the health challenge, we wanted to take the financial burden off their docket. So it's a simple decision complex, but when you boil it down, it's putting the customer patient front and center and trying to provide them peace of mind, which is what we did with our action. It, it's a complex decision. S&P Global Analysts estimated that in a severe pandemic that the medical costs for insurers could be near $100 billion. So as you take on this responsibility and some of your peers will likely follow, how are you going to be able to handle that? Well, um, again, we acknowledge we're in an unprecedented time. So let's step back and understand what we're, uh, what we're saying here. An individual has an out-of-pocket financial responsibility is tied to their insurance, whether it's commercial insurance, individual exchange insurance, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid. We're saying that we're going to take that individual responsibility on ourselves. Um, backing that is a large additional responsibility that either in order to the government in the case of Medicare Advantage or Medicaid or the um, corporate employer, which remains. So we're taking the portion for a COVID patient's um, um, treatment, and we're taking that financial obligation on. As a large diversified financial um, service company and health service company, we believe we're well positioned to be able to do so. Um, and we're going to track this over the next several months um, as we serve our customers and patients. But stepping back, fundamentally, we think it's the right thing to do because as individuals are um, in hospital situations dealing with the treatment, we wanted to take this burden off uh, their lap and off their family's lap and provide them the peace of mind they deserve. David, thank you so much, Jim. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, always, hey, Jim, good to hear your voice. Always good to hear you. Thank you for coming on, man, buddy, a bunch of times, too. I, I'm trying to figure out the priorities, and maybe it's multi-pronged, but what would help you the most? A, a five-minute Abbott test that would you tell you uh, what, your, uh, what some of the lives that you back are, are seeing? Or something about more personal protective equipment, because it does seem that you go through it very quickly, and that has uh, hurt the process in hospitals. I know that it's difficult to balance these, but I do feel like testing, testing, testing would really help Cigna. Yeah, um, Jim, maybe I'll boil it down into three, and I appreciate your question. Um, we've been working every other day. There's a group of CEO leaders who come together crossing hospital, lab, home health care, skilled nursing facility, uh, pharmacy services, our sector, et cetera, um, to ask those very questions. And, and you hit on um, two of the three. So one is PPE. We need to have um, within our country the ability to get the PPE or the personal protection equipment to the right place at the right time. Um, and the way in which the country is um, rising up to that is, is quite inspiring, although there are hot spots and additional acceleration that's necessary, both in the production and distribution. Second, then, is testing. Um, the accelerated testing, there's a hierarchy. Um, inpatient first, uh, medical professionals and first responders second, individuals who are high-risk third, and then others fourth from that standpoint. And then third is what we've all become accustomed to talking about now is social distancing, reducing the risk of onset. So taking on the responsibility to reduce the risk of onset, which all Americans have that responsibility. Um, we've learned now washing our hands for 20 seconds is really important. 
and we've learned social distancing is very important. So if you take those three items, while the medical system um, is working feverishly both to triage those who are ill, as well as to evolve both therapies and then ultimately vaccines, that's what we need. Those three items plus the medical system doing its, its work. Would a th- the number three item, social distancing, would that benefit from either a national lockdown or a national travel ban? Um, th- that's not my call. Um, I think you see the um, the country going through different phases of it. First and foremost, um, I'm proud to see what corporate America did. Corporate America stepped in and aggressively moved to supporting individuals to, to work at home. For example, um, we have probably in excess of 90 percent of all of our colleagues in a work at home situation. From that standpoint, because of the nature of our business, some people need to be in the work setting. Um, we've limited that. We facilitated it social distancing from that standpoint. We provide additional pay for those who have to be at work, whether it's tied to um, care delivery, pharmacy service delivery, et cetera. We also um, offered an additional 10 days of emergency PTO because we know individuals are trying to balance work, life, um, caregiver, the sandwich generation, et cetera. So I think, number one, corporations are stepping in quite aggressively. And then secondly, the government has to deal with this from a local to national and national to local basis. Um, We're not a one-size-fits-all country, and I think we're seeing in this case it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but the intensity is ramping up. I think that more um, more political leaders are finding that a uh, more aggressive posture relative to social distancing is probably in society's best interest over the near term. David, it's David Faber. Um, what is your sense right now in terms of the financial health of our nation's hospitals? I would assume they'll benefit from the fact that you're going to be covering uh, all the costs related to some of their patients or the patients who have your insurance. But uh, what are you hearing and how's this industry going to look once this virus passes? Yeah, there's strain to every um, every business. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, I was listening to Jim's comments just before I came on. So the strain is acute. As you deal with the hospital and the care delivery part of the equation, obviously we're seeing in the country um, those elective procedures or those deferrable procedures are being asked to be deferred um, by hospital leaders, by policy leaders, and otherwise. So that's an extraction of, of revenue. Um, from that standpoint, conversely, there's an onset of certain services that are being consumed. You're correct. The, the action we took, we're doing our part by essentially saying to hospitals, um, don't worry about that part of the reimbursement. Don't worry about that part of the collection process. Don't worry about bad debt that's attached to that. We want to support you from that standpoint. And then, um, David, as you saw with the stimulus bill, there's dollars being allocated right. um, toward our health care delivery system from that standpoint. So um, I think we're going to see, in most cases, the strongest of the strong will be there. Um, the strong players will provide support uh, for their brother and sister locations around the country. And some of the hospitals that may be in a little weaker financial state might find themselves in a state of disarray more rapidly. And elected officials need to be prepared to step in um, quickly to provide the financial backing that they need. Hey, David, it's Carl. Uh, I thought your your answer on testing priorities was interesting because Do you think the debate is going to come down to when we get high speed testing at scale and antibody testing at scale? uh, Do you test high risk individuals first uh, because of their vulnerability, like you said, or do we test low risk individuals first because they're the ones who are most able to get back to work? I think when the testing capacity expands, we're going to see in our country um, testing consumed at a higher rate across the board. My comment, Carl, was relative to the present time. So let, let's take an example of why I referenced what I did. Um, working with hospital partners, we were able to see that um, the priority is to get non-COVID patients out of the hospital, if possible, into long-term care, skilled nursing facilities, or home. So our industry worked with hospitals to accelerate those transitions, but we needed to make sure that individuals were COVID negative. So therefore, the prioritization of in-hospital in um, individuals consuming first. To your point, as the um, rate and scope of testing expands, and it is, companies like Quest, LabCorp, and others are ramping at quantum pace. And to your notion, there's additional t- testing in terms of speed or type of tests that expand. I think we'll see societally more consumption of the testing to help us identify individuals um, at risk or people who may be asymptomatic and carriers from that standpoint. That's the next chapter to come. My comment was more relative to the present state we're dealing with right now. 
David, one of the things that you've talked a lot about over the last couple of years is really whole health and mental health help. You've expanded telehealth access to mental health. Are you seeing people access this in this time when people may not be sick, but they're certainly feeling the stress? Bertha, I appreciate the question. Simple answer is yes. Um, you, you recall that we fielded um, the, the largest study of its kind um, some time ago relative to loneliness, and we're able to determine that um, in the United States, we have an elevated level of loneliness. The, the social distancing runs the risk of perpetuating that yet further. Um, so the ability to have um, mental health or whole person health services um, brought to bear and more easily accessible, including tele, is mission critical from that standpoint. Secondly, having mental health or whole person health services that are merged in with chronic care management, acute care management, et cetera, is mission critical because we see the two cohabitating. For example, if an individual has a chronic disease, about half of all Americans do, they're seven times more likely to be clinically depressed. If that clinical depression goes untreated, there's a multiplier effect on their health issue and health challenges from that standpoint. We're trying to acknowledge that, understand that, and step in. And to your point, um, telehealth is an example of expanding the access and services for the benefit of individuals. David, um, what about Cigna itself? To say this is an uncertain time is an understatement. But given that, a lot of the CEOs I speak to certainly are trying to figure out ways to pull back, uh, to cut expenses. Are you doing that as well? And if so, where? So it, we agree it's an unprecedented time. Um, stepping into 2020, we're carrying some meaningful momentum as a corporation. First, growth momentum, um, outstanding client and customer retention around the world, um, expansion of relationship and new business ads um, to the corporation from that standpoint. Um, but, but to the macro statement you make, um, there's no way a, a corporation could step back in the current environment and say, given everything I know today, what I thought I was going to execute in 2020 – I'm going to be able to execute it exactly the same. So it presses the dyna dynamism of a corporation uh, pretty aggressively. We are not arbitrarily pulling back on expenses. In fact, I made a reference of where we're spending more um, for our colleagues who need to be in the work setting um, in the provision of care or the supply of pharmacy resources from that standpoint. But we are and will dynamically reprioritize where and how we're investing. For example, we have a very large R&D discretionary investment pool in our corporation um, that we execute every year. We have a venture fund within our company that we execute um, within each and every year. Those investments would, would have a higher hurdle rate right now um, to be deployed simply because of the uh, uh, unstable environment that, that stands in front of us. So at a macro level, of course, we're revisiting, but there's not an across-the-board cut because our 170 million customer relationships around the world um, obviously still need to be served, and we're growing in those relationships, and we need to be in position to serve them. All right, uh, David, Jim, one thing I'm trying to understand, you're an international company. Why are things less dire in Germany, very dire in Italy, and catastrophic in Spain? Uh, Jim, I don't think I'm um, the right person to give you a pinpointed answer. Um, I think if we step back and look at a few points of similarity, let's take South Korea and Italy as an example, um, two ends of the spectrum. Um, what, what South Korea proved is a couple of things. One, South Korea has um, um, a population that is older on average. Italy is even older. So data point one, we know COVID-19 affects an older population more acutely. Point two, it seems to affect older males a bit more acutely than older females. Italy's population not only skews older, but skews older male. Three, um, it attacks smokers a bit more aggressively. And while South Korea has a somewhat elevated smoking percentage, Italy has even a higher smoking percentage. So, so you take that as a population measure. Second piece, it's clear South Korea was extremely aggressive and constructive relative to what we know today is social distancing and testing. If you look at Italy, they were less aggressive relative to social distancing, even after the country put forth certain mandates, and less comprehensive relative to testing. So I take two cohorts. One, the data around the profile of the people, age, age and sex mix, smoking. There's higher risk across the board in, in this case, Italy. And then secondly, how aggressive one was with social distancing and how aggressive one was with testing 
to inform that social distancing and inform the triaging. Those seem to be playing out as we look at the comparison to um, Spain versus Germany. That pattern seems to be playing out pretty consistently.